2022 American Diabetes Association Living with Diabetes Ask the Experts series. Today's topic is reducing the risk of stroke. My name is Carla Cox, registered dietitian nutritionist and certified diabetes care and education specialist and your host for today's program. Our Ask the Experts series is all about answering questions from our listeners. So start getting your questions ready. For those of you on the phone, press star three on your keypad and an operator will collect your question. That's star three. And they will place you in a queue so that you may have the opportunity to ask your question live. To participate online, type in your name and question in the fields below the streaming player, press the submit question button and your question will come directly to us. Stay with us through the hour and you will learn useful tips to help you live well on your journey with diabetes. In addition, we invite you to provide us with your feedback in our survey when you leave the event. We will use the information to help us plan for future events. There are two options to participate in the survey. You may complete the survey online by going to tinyurl.com forward slash ATE002. Enter tinyurl, tinyurl.com once again, forward slash ATE002 into any web browser to complete the survey via your computer. Or text the code at ATE0510 to the number 833-373-0403 to complete the survey on your mobile phone. Again, that is at ATE. 0510 to the number 833-373-0403 to complete the survey by text message. If you are joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or listening to our podcasts, please be sure to give us your feedback by completing the survey as well. The survey access information is also available throughout the session on the ticker tape at the bottom of your screen. Okay, now a little bit about why we're here today. Because of the link between diabetes and heart health, the American Diabetes Association, in collaboration with the American Heart Association, has launched No Diabetes by Heart with support from founding sponsors Novo Nordisk, as well as national sponsor Bayer. The No Diabetes by Heart initiative provides tools and resources for people living with type 2 diabetes to learn how to reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke. As part of the initiative, the ADA is holding this free educational Q&A once a month. We'll cover information and tips to help you take charge of your health. For our most up-to-date information, please visit our website, diabetes.org forward slash coronavirus if you have any questions on the coronavirus and follow the CDC recommendations. ADA also recommends a vaccination for those with diabetes. All right. I am happy to introduce Dr. William Hicks as our expert today. Dr. Hicks is a neurologist specializing in vascular neurology. As a vascular neurologist, Dr. Hicks specializes in conditions of the cere cerebral vascular system, including ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. His main areas of interest include rapid access to acute stroke rescue therapies and clinical trials. Dr. Hicks serves as the co-director of the Riverside Methodist Hospital Comprehensive Stroke Center. He's been a key leader for the Ohio Stroke Network, bringing stroke expertise to the bedside of roughly 30 hospitals and emergency rooms throughout Ohio. In addition, his work as the Ohio Health Physician Lead of Columbus Mobile Stroke Treatment Unit will soon help usher in this unique stroke treatment to the city. Dr. Hicks, would you like to add a few lines of the intro here? Not at all. You, 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 uh, you said it all, and I appreciate uh, you for that introduction and also for having me on this very important uh, discussion. I'm sorry we uh, can't see each other visually, um, but I had to uh, leave my office abruptly to deal with uh, a medical matter with my son, but I, I uh, would would rather uh, spend my time uh, doing anything else. As a type one diabetic, uh, this is very near and dear to my heart and my brain. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hicks. As we are waiting for our callers and online listeners to chime in, I'm gonna go ahead and kick off with the first question. 
Could you please spend a few minutes setting the stage for us today? Can you briefly discuss how diabetes and stroke are linked? Well, it's an unfortunate marriage of the two. Um, but uh, what we do know is that diabetes, like other things like smoking and high blood pressure, it's a major risk factor uh, for stroke. There seems to be between almost a two to six fold increased risk of stroke compared to those without diabetes. And as we all on this call can imagine, it has a lot to do with how we control uh, blood sugar and glucose. So there are uh, millions of people, unfortunately, at risk. And, and even uh, pre-diabetes, which as a lot of us know is a precursor to type 2 diabetes, that also can increase uh, one's risk. Um, you know, those with diabetes, there's just uh, not only a, the non-bleeding type of stroke, uh, but also the bleeding or the hemorrhagic uh, type of stroke has an increased risk, about two, you know, uh, two times uh, greater risk compared to non, uh, non-diabetics. Um, those that have hard to control glucose or blood sugar who have unfortunately had a stroke, they are notoriously uh, more difficult to get a significant recovery from. So in the world of stroke, the thing that I'm very passionate about is providing stroke reversal treatment options to try to reverse the, the stroke symptoms and, and stop them in their tracks. And unfortunately, patients that have high blood sugar, when we're giving these treatment options, uh, that is a big reason why they may not recover as well as those that have normal blood sugar. So I'm saying all of this to say just how important it is to be obsessive about blood glucose control, not only uh, to prevent a stroke from happening in the first place, but God forbid if a stroke were to occur, lower the chance of, of it happening. And, and a lot of people ask, you know, well, well what's the big deal? What, why does, does why is there this unhappy marriage? Why are they uh, linked? So, and the belief is that, and, and what we know with the science is that we have blood vessels all throughout our brain and blood vessels that lead into our brains. And those blood vessels are kind of flimsy, like a, you know, kind of like a, um, like a jump rope, so to speak. And what we don't want to have happen is those blood vessels to get stiff or to thicken as far as the uh, the inner layer of the blood vessel. And what high blood sugars do is it does stiffen those blood vessels, which which is what we don't want to see. And, and what makes it hard for blood to go through the blood vessel, and when it's hard for blood to kind of trudge through the blood vessel, the blood flow gets stopped and it causes a stroke. And sometimes the blood vessel gets so hurt, it gets so stiff, and over time pressure builds up in that blood vessel. And like the adage says, pressure bust pipes, and that can cause bleeding stroke. Thank you. If you're just joining us, welcome to today's Ask the Experts Q&A reducing the risk of stroke. As a reminder, for those of you on the phone, press star three, that's star three on your keypad, and an operator will collect your question and place you in a queue so that you can have your opportunity to ask your questions live. To participate online, type in your name and question in the fields below the streaming player. Press submit the question button and your question will come directly to us. Remember, today's topic is reducing the risk of stroke. So let's remember to focus on that topic. Okay. Let's take our first question. Uh, we're going to take a question from Cheryl. Cheryl is from Wisconsin. Cheryl, you're on live. Whoa. Wondering. There we go, Cheryl. You're on now. Sorry. 
Yes, uh, Dr. Hicks, Cheryl Ann Reifenberg calling from Boyceville, Wisconsin. And what are some of the things that you can do to reduce, reduce your risk of stroke? What are some of the things you can do to help with getting your blood sugars at the right level and your AC1? Uh, is losing weight part of it and exercise? Thank you, Cheryl, for that question. I, I could not have, uh, have tailored it any better myself. I think it's a great kickoff sort of uh, question that I, I love to tackle on behalf of my patients and hopefully people that never become my patients. So what we want to know is that there are what we call modifiable risk factors. There are things that we can do as human beings to lower that chance. And 80% of our stroke risk, uh, of the most common stroke, stroke risk factors, are uncontrolled blood pressure and cigarette smoking. So if we're a diabetic, and if we do one of those two things or both of those things, we are really asking for it. So those two things have got to be, again, we have to be obsessive about lowering our risk. So if we're a smoker, we've got to work with our primary care physician or work with our family or whomever is a trigger to make sure that we, we eradicate smoking and do everything we can to, to get rid of that quote unquote habit. And I know it's a, a serious one to break, but uh, it, it is that important. And, and blood pressure, you know, we're, we're on a call about diabetes, but blood pressure and diabetes, they often do go hand in hand, unfortunately, and they are, they, they in concert can cause a lot of problems. And what we know, the more we've studied blood pressure, the more we have found that the tighter the blood pressure control, the lower the chance of a stroke. So now the newest guidelines are your top number, your systolic blood pressure of 130 or less. And so that's a change over prior years. So a lot of people get a false sense of security because maybe several years ago or several decades ago, someone said that your blood pressure in the 140s or 150s is fine, or because you have a, a parent or a relative whose blood pressure was horrible and yours isn't that bad, that it's not a big deal. You know, I, I've heard all these sorts of things. I've also heard things like, well, my blood pressure has always been tough to control, or it, it, it's always been bad. And then it, it's kind of like this apathetic, almost like a badge of honor at times. People just say, hey, it's just tough to deal with. And uh, my doctor says, this is as good as we're going to get. And all of these things are, are, are absolute no-nos. And we cannot settle for that kind of mentality because if you're a diabetic and you've, if you have blood pressure issues, we can't just throw our hands up because that is a serious risk. You mentioned other things, which was exercise, you know, kind of moving your body. Our society has moved away from just what I like to call free exercise. You know, there are patients that just, that, or sorry, there are people in, in, in previous generations where, be it the type of work that they did or, or the type of neighborhoods they lived in, they were just naturally moving and naturally getting just natural exercise to get the heart rate up. A lot of times due to, quite frankly, recently, the COVID scare, um, due to, um, you know, maybe uh, suboptimal neighborhoods for movement, a lot of these different reasons, uh, people d don't get the free, free exercise. And, and that's not to mention the type of work that we're doing these days that are often sedentary and often uh, kind of revolving around a computer for uh, all the live long day. So. Any sort of exercise to get our heart rates up, to really move our body and, and, and get the heart rate up for at least about 20 minutes for the majority of the week is ideal. And then the one thing I always like to mention is our diet. Um, there are different ways to eat, different diabetic uh, appropriate diets. There is great research on what's called the Mediterranean diet. And those principles, I think if you 
talk things over with your endocrinologist or your primary care doctor. Um, you'll, you'll, if you've ever discussed optimal nutrition, you'll find that a lot of things in the Mediterranean diet are very close to what you've been hearing, if not identical to what you've been hearing from your, your healthcare provider. And if not, I would strongly look into adhering to the Mediterranean diet. There is great evidence that it lowers the risk of heart disease and stroke, and it's, and it's very beneficial for heart health and brain health overall, and for diabetics. Um, I can go on and on, but uh, those are, are really kind of hard-hitting points that I, I want to leave everybody with. Great. And, and I think if people are struggling with what to eat, having a visit with a dietitian that's well um, knows a lot about diabetes is really helpful too. And certainly would, they would be the Mediterranean diet, it would certainly be a recommendation from them. So it would be a one-on-one, -on -one, that might be a, a nice thing to do as well um, to help them. Well, well, well said. A lot of endocrinologists have dietitians on board or, or kind of diabetes management programs have dietitians. I, I know for years in our stroke prevention clinic, we, we had a dietitian. And what we found is that a lot of the uh, diabetes specialists and endocrinologists already had uh, dietitians, um, which I, I feel is of paramount importance for anyone dealing with diabetes. You've got to be intimately involved with, with the dietitian. So that's a great call out. Yeah. Okay, we have a, a, a call in coming in from Shari, I think it is, Parks from Detroit, Michigan. Shari? Shari, you're on the phone. Shari, are you, good? are you there? Well, we have her question here, so I'll ask it. Um, if your blood sugar is high, what you, what can you do to prevent a stroke? Well, Shari, uh, I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to chat, but um, uh, for, for, for two reasons. Number one, uh, that's my sister's name. Uh, and number two, I used to live in Detroit, uh, and I did my neurology training there. So I have a lot of uh, fond, fond memories of, of Detroit. Now. Regarding what to do if your blood sugar is high, um, you know, th that, that's more of a question for your individual uh, physician or, or treatment provider. Um, you know, if you're an insulin-dependent diabetic, you know, a lot of times people are on what's called sliding scale uh, ways. So if, if your blood sugar is at a certain level, then you um, can tailor it to whatever they, they have in the, in the sliding scale. There, more recently, there are, you know, obviously uh, pill forms of medication. So just staying compliant with uh, the regimen of, of oral uh, diabetes medications that uh, have been proven to lower uh, the risk. Um, a lot of times after kind of working with, working with the medications and other things, if you notice that there are occasional spikes throughout the day, very important to do a personal inventory about what am I eating and what am I doing at the time I get these spikes. So oftentimes it might be immediately after a meal. And then you have to start to think and say, is this meal most appropriate for me and my diabetes? What is it within the meal that's, that's leading to such a spike in blood sugar? A lot of people forget about what we're drinking, what we're consuming with drinks. And they may think that they're, they're okay because I instead of drinking pop and, and you know those of us in the Midwest call soda pop so that includes Detroit um, you know instead of drinking pop oh I switched to juice and that's not the way or oh I'm drinking iced teas now uh, or I like coffee and I'm adding sugar in my coffee all these sorts of things are secret ways that, that increase uh, uh, one's blood glucose and then finally, it's just what type of meals am I consuming? Are they heavy in starches and other sorts of things that can cause long-lasting rises in glucose? All of these things play a role. And in addition to working with your provider about am I on the appropriate medication? Am I on the appropriate dose of that? Does there need to be a change in that? And then also... Am I listening to the recommendations that my dietitian gave to me once upon a time, or has it been so long 
that maybe I need to see a dietitian to kind of go over my day-to-day -day diet to avoid this high, high blood sugar. Because quite frankly, when that is a constant theme, your A1C stays elevated. And we know that an elevated A1C can cause things like heart disease and stroke. Finally, what we're learning a lot, and I like to uh, kind of keep people abreast of this, is the impact of stressors. And a lot of the stressors are from anything under the sun. We all know it can cause stress. But sometimes just day-to-day -day living in certain environments, um, certain kind of underserved and underappreciated parts of society where financially, you know, with housing, with your overall environment, with your element of safety or lack thereof, with kind of feeling of persecution um, as, as a certain member of society, uh, or just generational trauma of, of any kind, be it kind of immediate trauma, something that's happening to you day to day, or something that has happened to you in the past, or something that generationally has happened to you and your people, that has been shown to cause an elevation in cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone in our body that occurs basically when we're in a fight or flight mode. When we're in this fight or flight mode, then, you know, naturally, if, we're, if we need to run from a bear back in the days when we were kind of amongst nature and we had to run against kind of scary animals and other things, that type of hormone cortisol was helpful because it, it gave us an extra boost to overcome what we had to overcome. But it is not okay to have high levels of cortisol for long periods of time. And what researchers have discovered is that life stressors, generational trauma, can carry on and cause a, an elevation of this cortisol. And guess what that does? It raises your blood glucose, regardless of the type of medicines you're on. It also raises your blood pressure. So all of these things can increase one's risk of stroke in our diabetes population. So something else to strongly consider, mindfulness, wellness, other ways to get appropriate sleep, hydrate with water, work on relaxation techniques and overall wellness ways to kind of counteract life stressors if we deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Especially in the in the, the age of COVID, this is of utmost importance. Thank you. We have a question coming in from Jan. Jan is from um, California. Jan, you're on the line. Hi. Um, about a year and a half Two years ago, I had two mild strokes, and since then, my memory has been worse, bad. And my husband will say something, and, and I have no idea what he's talking about. Is there any way that I or a doctor or somebody can help me get my memory back? Thank you, Janet. I, I believe it was Janet or, or Janice. Um, but. Uh, th thank you for your candor and, and sharing your story. Uh, this is something that I deal with a lot um, as a neurologist, number one, but as a neurologist who, who, who deals with stroke. What I often want to know and what I often want patients to be aware of is that that is not okay um, and that needs to be looked into. And oftentimes, it, re it requires a little bit more than maybe what a primary care physician or a provider is used to looking into. Um, and that's where a neurologist can come in handy. Um, things that I often do for my patients who have these uh, subjective issues is I kind of cover our bases. I look and I, I, I want to take a look at that brain and see Number one, has there been any changes since those two strokes? Are there anything, is there anything else going on in the brain besides those two, quote, mini strokes that you had? Because you want to look at the whole brain picture and see, has there been things that have happened to your brain over time that you may not have felt, but it kind of has an additive effect, kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back? You know, it kind of, 
it kind of adds up, adds up, adds up. You may not notice it. And then here comes a few strokes, and then it causes some problems. So a great, a good, clear picture of the brain, a recent one, I think is important. And to discuss those findings with a neurologist who deals with this sort of a thing. And that could be a general neurologist, it could be a stroke specialist, and it could also be what's called a cognitive neurologist. Those are very rare, but those are neurologists that, that focus in on memory disorders and, and issues with memory. The other thing I like to know is, is how is your blood sugar doing? Fluctuations in blood sugar cause issues with our cognition. When you're, if, if, if one's blood sugar drops very low, you are not going to be at your normal self, and I'm sure a lot of us have felt that. And, and conversely, if our blood sugar is high, if it's elevated for a prolonged period of time, you are going to be cognitively impaired as well. So, again, harping back to the importance of strict control of blood sugar, it has a lot of effects, including how you're, you're feeling and, and how your brain is working. Things like sleep hygiene. A lot of patients have sleep apnea and they do not know it. I've mentioned this before on this talk. Making sure that your sleep hygiene is appropriate because sleep apnea basically means that your oxygen level when you sleep is dropping and your body is reflexively resetting itself and you're kind of having to gasp for, for air. And when you do that, it's the broken record effect of getting deep, restful sleep. Deep restful sleep is like what we need for our cell phones. When we plug in that cell phone, that is essentially what, that's your, that's your phone getting deep restful sleep. And if we kind of have it half on, half off, you know, we've, we've had that scenario where the, the phone maybe was, was plugged in and it charged for a little bit and then it fell off. That's essentially what sleep apnea does. So you can have it on the, you know, connected to the cord for three hours, but then when you look at it, it only gave you, you know, 10% more charge. And you have to go your whole day using the phone at work, and it, it's just not going to work as well. The same goes with your brain. If you're not getting good sleep, your cognition is going to be a little off, and that's especially true after stroke. Um, other things like hydrating with water. If we're not hydrating ourselves throughout the day. If we're dehydrated, we're just not going to be as sharp as we want to be cognitive. Other kinds of infections and other kinds of vitamin deficiencies, like B12, uh, folate, vitamin D, PSH, these sorts of changes, if, if those haven't been checked in a while, it's important to check these things. If all of those things come back okay, I often send my patients to get formal neuropsychological testing. And that is with a neuropsychologist, and a neuropsychologist she or he does very detailed brain tests to discern what is the reason behind the, the cognitive impairment. And being in the office with patients for 45 minutes or an hour or a half an hour does not cut it. It requires several hours of very detailed testing. And what we find is that a lot of times patients with, who've had strokes their, their severe depression and anxiety after the stroke events are the reason why they're cognitively not themselves. Or do they have other sorts of underlying conditions? Do they have other medical conditions that are causing the problem? Or do they have something that is what we call a neurodegenerative condition? It's a primary neurological issue like vascular dementia. In vascular dementia, is a type of dementia. The most common of dementias are Alzheimer's disease. This is different from Alzheimer's in that the blood vessels in our brain, if they have a lot of changes to them, if they, that leads to scarring of the brain tissue, and that could also lead to strokes. So if there's a lot of that that has happened, that alone can cause issues with cognition. And again, we found that people that have long-standing, poorly controlled glucose and long-standing blood pressure that's constantly above 
the, the top number or the systolic number of 140, if it's constantly above that for years and years, your risk of cognitive problems goes up fourfold compared to someone with controlled blood pressure or controlled diabetes. So I know that's a lot to think your teeth into, but I that those are the, the things that I always want to make sure I go over with my patients who are reporting issues with their memory. I'm sure there's a lot of you on the call, so thank you for for um, for being candid for the sake of everyone uh, with us today. Great, thank you. Okay, we have a question online coming in from Pamela King. What about high cholesterol? What does it have to do with diabetes and stroke? Well, high cholesterol is another risk factor for stroke. Um, and diabetics tend to have, um, compared to non-diabetics, there tends to be a higher chance that there is high cholesterol as well. There's kind of a metabolic syndrome we like to call it. It's, you know, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, high cholesterol, and a kind of a, um, some obesity, especially in and around the stomach. Um, those things a lot of times work in concert, and those things together add up to increase the risk of stroke significantly. But individually, high cholesterol can also lead to thickening of the artery wall. It's providing plaque or kind of gook crud around those blood vessels. So the flow of blood is not as smooth and it just narrows and narrows and narrows. You can imagine, you know, you're trying to get the blood flow through the pipe of, of an artery. And because over time, if there's plaque in and around that pipe, it just becomes too narrowed and it can cause strokes by itself. Hot, big or large blood vessels, the common one is called the carotid artery, but there are others in our necks and in our brains. Those often can, can have plaque buildup and that can cause plaque or, or like little pieces of the plaque to flick off and travel high into the brain and cause a stroke by itself. For years, kind of towards the beginning of my time in stroke care, we used to have this very bleak attitude towards people with strokes from narrowed blood vessels because the, the chance of them having stroke after stroke was very high. But then we started to study the medicines to lower cholesterol, these statin medications. And lo and behold, being on the statin medicines helps reduce the plaque creation and buildup in these blood vessels. And it helps lower the inflammation that can occur in and around those blood vessels. And that thankfully lowers the risk of stroke and heart disease as a result. And it's the, the data or the, the, the science behind these medicines are, is so good that what's happened now, what, what happens now is that if you've had a stroke that the doctors think are from narrowed blood vessels or these hardening of the arteries, and especially if you're a diabetic, then they will put you put patients on aggressive cholesterol medicines, these statins, because regardless of your cholesterol number, the medicines are so protective and helpful. So that's why that is an important tool in the arsenal that stroke doctors like myself and just other uh, physicians and providers use to lower the risk of stroke and heart disease especially in our diabetic patients. Thank you. So we have a question coming in from Ann, and Ann is from Washington State. Ann, you're on the line. Hello? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you so much for taking my call. Um, I've been listening, and I really appreciate his answers. 
Um, my cholesterol is within normal limits. I'm on a blood thinner because I recently had a saddle pulmonary embolism and a DVT. I have tried many times many different statins, and I uh, cannot tolerate them. And I have a moderate to severe right internal carotid artery narrowing. My dad had a zillion strokes. I have uh, peripheral artery and um, vein disease. And I, I'm i not sure. I'm really worried about the right ICA in my brain. And um, the only solution seems to be to take statins, and I can't take them. Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, kind of scenario, and, it, and unfortunately, you're not alone with, with that, that issue. You know, the statin medicines, I, I kind of wax poetic about how uh, advantageous they've been in lowering the risk of stroke and heart disease in our patients, and, and there's it's no secret why they are year in and year out uh, the most commonly prescribed medications in America. Um, but they're not candy. And so there are several patients like yourself that are trying to do the right thing and doing everything they can to take these medicines, and they just do not agree with them. They can cause very, very painful muscle aches and cramping. They can cause changes in our uh, muscle um, enzymes, and it can kind of cause some problems. It can cause very dramatic fatigue and, and some other things. So there are some real side effects out there for them. And would I always have my patients who have that severe statin allergy if they've tried all the various different uh, iterations or versions of statins, then thankfully there are newer medicines that have come out to dramatically lower LDL or bad cholesterol even more robust than statins. And they are injectable um, cholesterol medications that, um, that, that, that are appropriate in cases like yours. Now, there, is, there are newer medicines, which means that they are more expensive, which means that the insurance has to cover it. A lot of statins you can pay out of pocket and still, they're still affordable. But these medicines are so new and it often requires the physician to go through what's called a prior authorization to green light the importance of you being on the medicine. And so a lot of primary care physicians and, and providers are, are used to these medicines. The, 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 the one that came out first is called Repatha, R-E-P-A-T-H-A. And I believe there are others out there, but that's, that's probably the, the, the most common one. And Finally, there are doctors that their sole purpose is lipid management. We call them lipidologists. You know, just like I'm a neurologist, there are lipidologists. And they're typically family medicine or internal medicine doctors that did subspecialty training in lipid management. So those type of doctors are out there. Um, you know, Ohio Health, where I work, we, we have lipidologists and, and a lot of academic medical centers and even some other larger healthcare systems have lipidologists. So if, if, if anyone on the call, including yourself, if, if you're at an impasse about this, then I would strongly recommend looking into these injectable lipid lowering medicines and or Finding a lipidologist, a doctor that, that uh, is uh, solely manages uh, cholesterol. And for diabetics who can't take the statins, uh, who've had uh, a strong family history of, of uh, vascular disease and who have known vascular changes on a carotid or any other blood vessels, I think it's an important thing to do. So uh, I, I hope you, you follow through with that. It sounds like you're doing all the right things that you know how, and, and maybe this can be helpful for you. Great. 
So listeners, are you familiar with diabetes self-management education? Some of you sound like you would uh, use that. So diabetes education programs provide services that focus on your concerns about diabetes and will empower you with the knowledge and skills to manage it. They link you to support resources in your community. You can find an ADA approved program in your area by clicking on the find a program link on our webpage, diabetes.org forward slash experts. All right, so we have another write-in question. What are, and this comes from Carol, what are your thoughts on aspirin as stroke heart disease prevention and diabetes with a person who has no history of heart disease? So th this is a ever evolving and changing topic. Um, there is recent data that have, have, have come out about aspirin that is saying that if you are asymptomatic, if you don't have symptoms, then, and if you haven't had a vascular event, like a heart related event or a stroke related, brain related event, then aspirin may not be indicated. But in certain patients that may have tough to control diabetes or long-standing diabetes, or if you're at a certain age and you have, especially over 65, or if you have other risk factors for stroke, a lot of those that I mentioned today, sometimes with discussion with your primary care doctor, or any of the specialists that I kind of talked about, like your endocrinologist or a cardiologist or a neurologist, sometimes they may say, hey, because of all of these other issues, it would behoove you to take the aspirin every day. But as far as just someone who just says, I have diabetes and should I take the aspirin or not? The short answer is no, but if there are other caveats, then it's it's something that oftentimes physicians will discuss with their with their patients who may have other risk factors that are notable. It's an ever-changing topic. Thank you. So this question is not about stroke, but it is about neuropathy. So we're going to bring in Janice from San Mateo, California to ask her question. Janice, you're on the line. Oh, thanks. Um, so my question was, um, uh, neuropathy, can that be uh, helped with exercise? And if so, daily, oh, how long? Uh, and if there's time, i really like to know uh, why uh, even pre-diabetics could get neuropathy. Thank you. Um, to a neurologist, uh, this is a this is a serious issue. Of course, there, it's an interplay between neurology and endocrinology. Um, thankfully, there's no correlation between neuropathy and, and stroke, but um, it is what happens is elevated blood sugar, and, and, and you you hit it. You hit the nail on the head. It doesn't have to be truly diagnosed diabetes. It can just be elevated glucose in your blood or pre-diabetes. If it's long-standing, the elevated blood sugar in the bloodstream and in and around the nerve endings causes them to fray. And that can cause irritation. It can cause kind of like a short-circuit effect. And that essentially is what neuropathy is. And sometimes, as a lot of us on the call know, it could just be you're not feeling the the lower parts of the of the uh, of your feet or even in your hands as well. Um, and, and other times, it can cause this burning, painful, paresthesia kind of uh, pins and needles um, sensation. Um, as far as does exercise is that curative? I can't say that it is. What I can say, of course, is that exercise is helpful for your diabetes, and everything you do to help your diabetes will help offset or 
stop or at least slow down the progression of what we call end organ damage from diabetes, meaning issues with our vision or issues with our kidney function or issues with our nerves or neuropathy. So that exercise is very important kind of as a preventative to make sure, okay, it's in the toes right now, it's in certain parts of the feet right now, but I, but I don't want to just throw up my hands and be apathetic and then um, it, it, within the next couple of years, it's up half my ankle. You know, and, and that's what that's what tends to happen with neuropathy. The more uncontrolled the glucose is, the more aggressive it becomes as far as marching further up the extremities and, and causing more and more problems. Um, so the the exercise may not get rid of it. Um, you know, oftentimes medications are are helpful. Um, there's various different types. There's there's also um, you know non kind of westernized uh, uh, added uh, treatment options um, as well, um, acupuncture being one of them uh, that I often uh, recommend to certain patients that has uh, some levels of success, uh, depending on uh, the, uh, the person doing the, uh, the acupuncture, but um, I, I hope that was helpful. Thank you. So another writing question, many people, uh, many people over the age of 65 have atrial fibrillation. Is that related to stroke? And if so, how is it related and what treatment can they take? AFib is a huge stroke risk factor. It increases as we age. Your, your chance or your likelihood of developing AFib or atrial fibrillation increases as you age. Essentially what AFib is, is it's an abnormal change in the heart rhythm. Our heart normally beats like a drum. We know we've all heard it, love dub, love dub, love dub. You know, it's that bump, bump kind of rhythmic sensation, uh, sound that we hear with a stethoscope or we see on an echocardiogram or we see on the, on the monitor, the telemetry monitor in the hospital. What AFib what happens with AFib is that the heart chamber tends to change in size. One of the chambers of the heart, called the left atrium, tends to expand and just change in size, like we all do as we age. And when that happens, there's a chance that the rhythm is disrupted. So instead of the normal beating of that drum, it becomes a little jazz-like, where it's a little erratic with the heart rhythm change. And a heart that does that is a heart that has a propensity to develop blood clots within it for whatever reason. And it doesn't have to be the exact second the AFib happens. It's just that the heart that fibrillates is a heart that clots can form in the chamber of the heart. And then whenever it beats normally, that blood clot, because whenever blood is not in constant motion, if it's, if it's in an area that's just fibrillating and jiggling around, it's not in constant free flow motion. And that means that that blood can harden. And you know how jello pudding stays out for too long and it gets that hardened portion on the top. And if you're not kind of constantly swirling it around, it's not liquidified. It's not liquefied. The same sort of scenario happens with blood. And so that's how that blood clot forms in a heart that has AFib. And it can flick up through the blood, excuse me, through the heart, up into the blood vessels that are in your neck and go into your brain. And it can cause various levels of stroke, from the catastrophic types to the very, very minor types. And anyone that's had a stroke-like event and they have AFib, they're at a much higher risk of stroke. I'd say a five-fold risk, five times higher than the average, quote-unquote, average person that does not have AFib. They're at a five times higher risk of developing stroke, and that risk increases as we age. And a lot of people don't know because you just assume that males are may, may have kind of worse habits as far as 
as medical care and not seeking medical care and not taking care of themselves. Well, women live longer as, as a result of that. But guess what? AFib increases as women age, as anybody ages. So the risk of AFib is higher in women than men for that reason. So it's important if you feel your heart beat in a funny way to get it checked out. Um, if you've had a stroke-like event and the doctors aren't quite sure why it happened, if there's not dramatic narrowing of a blood vessel where the stroke happened, and if your blood sugar is under great control and your blood pressure is under great control and it just kind of came out of the sky, so to speak, it's very important that your heart be monitored even after you've left the hospital to make sure that you don't have secret AFib that you can't even feel which is the most common way people have AFib. Most people don't feel it. So finally, oftentimes I'm, I'm dismayed in the number of patients that come in with a serious, oftentimes life-altering or life-ending stroke, and they knew that they had AFib, but they were not on a blood-thinning medication. And that is so devastating because these blood thinning medicines, the oldest one is called warfarin or Coumadin, but there are newer ones out there, commonly called Apixaban or Eliquis or Rivaroxaban or Xarelto or Dabigatran or Pradaxa. These medicines are very safe to take and they interact well with the other medicines, especially these newer ones I mentioned. And patients sadly don't take them nearly as often as they should. And it's for a lot of times very frivolous reasons that the majority of stroke specialists do not agree with. So if, if anyone's ever said, oh yeah, you have AFib, but we're not gonna put you on a blood thinner for reason X or reason Y, or even if you, if you don't remember why, then it's time for a second opinion because it's that serious and it's that severe a risk of stroke especially severe stroke. Thank you. So that wraps up our last question for the session. A few items before we close today. Dr. Hicks, could you give us the three most important, I know there's a long list, but the three most important things you can do for yourself to prevent a stroke? Well, um, I would say if you smoke, never, Never take another puff or stop immediately or work your hardest to stop that from ever uh, continuing. That's becoming less of an issue, but it's still very prevalent in certain segments of the population. And that is a major modifiable risk factor, as we like to say. So that's number one. Number two, know your numbers, know your numbers, know your numbers, and know the right numbers and be obsessive about getting to those right numbers, and by numbers I mean your A1C or your kind of routine glucose level, be it with a continuous glucose monitor, that is revolutionary. So just know what your numbers are doing. You know, we should not be living in a world where we don't know our glucose numbers, we don't know our blood pressure numbers, because otherwise we're asking for it. And we, we need to find a healthcare provider equally as obsessive about getting you under great control as hopefully you are. And if you don't find that there's alignment there, we live in a free country, you can seek a second opinion, you can find a, a clinician that does uh, kind of take this very, very seriously. Um, and then the, the, the third thing is, is be fast. And this is very loaded because you only gave me three things, so I'm going to kind of <laughs> load up the truck here. But, um, you know, BFAST is an acronym for stroke signs and symptoms. Really quickly, B is for balance. E is meaning if your balance suddenly goes off. E is for eyes. If your eyes suddenly, if your vision suddenly goes out, if you lose vision out of one eye, or if one section of your vision suddenly goes away and blacks out, that's a stroke-like symptom, so that's B and E. And then fast, F is for your face. If your face droops down, then that is an emergency. That's a stroke-like symptom. A is for arm. If your arm suddenly gets weak, 
or it's suddenly numb, same goes with your legs, same thing, but that's a sudden change. S is for speech. If your speech is suddenly changed, it's suddenly dramatically slurred. Suddenly you can't get the words out the way you'd like. It's like word finding difficulty or you, you're speaking gobbledygook with your words. It's like a word, word salad. It's not making sense. That's a stroke sign. And so that's the B fast. And then T is for time for B fast. It's not time to Google Dr. Hicks and where's his office and how do I call him. It's not call my primary care doctor. It's not call my relative who's in health care. It's dial 911 because that's the quickest way to get the treatment you deserve to reverse stroke-like symptoms. We can treat strokes. We can reverse strokes. But the key is getting to the hospital in time. Great. Thanks for your long list of three. <laughs> um, Thriving with Diabetes takes a village and we're here to support you. Special thanks to our expert, Dr. Hicks, today. I am Carla Cox and on behalf of the ADA team, we want to thank you for joining us today and we look forward to connecting with you at our next Ask the Experts events, June 14, partnering with clinicians, conversations you should have with your healthcare provider, and on July 12, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> We now invite you to take part in our survey, which will help us to plan for future events. There are two options to participate in the survey. You may complete the survey online by going to tinyurl.com forward slash ATE002. Once again, enter tinyurl.com forward slash ATE002 into any web browser to complete the survey via your computer, or you can text the code at ATE0510 to the number 833-373-0403 to complete your survey on your mobile phone. Again, that is at ATE0510 to the number 833-373-0403. Three seven three zero four zero three to complete the survey by text message. If you're joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or listening to our podcast, please be sure to give us your feedback by completing the survey. If you have questions about this event, please email askada at diabetes.org and include Ask the Experts Q&A in your subject line. And thank you so much for joining us today.